Whispers of the Earth by Eric J. Guignard The day was March 25th, and it was the 10th anniversary of his wife's death. That day, today, was etched into his mind as permanently as the letters that spelled Hannah's name on the slab of stone in Franklin Cemetery. Her memory would never leave him, but most days he could push it behind him like a signpost he'd driven past and could only faintly make out in the receding distance. Of course, as this day drew nearer, the distance he traveled from the signpost seemed to reverse, and he watched it like a thing in the rearview mirror as it returned closer and closer. Lyle knew today would be worse than her other death anniversaries, and that knowledge did not deceive. Ten years, after all, was the same amount of time they had been wed. Tomorrow, she would be dead longer than they were together. Married at thirty, dead at forty, alone at fifty. For none of us liveth to himself, and no man dieth to himself. The words of Pastor Scott, who then found it necessary to repeat the passage in simplified terms, Hannah's love will continue on in the memories of those she touched. If Lyle were a vessel for the Lord, as Pastor Scott said he was, then it was true she would live forever in him, hovering in the back of his thoughts, sharing his intimate struggles, whispering sweet memories of their life together whispering his name. Lyle, she said, I miss you so much. He knew she did miss him, as he missed her. She said as much in his thoughts. Hannah's death was never reconciled, never explained. Pastor Scott spoke of his grief, warned him not to question God's will, to have faith in her absence, to accept that her body was taken back to the earth. I'm all alone, somewhere lost in the earth. Another reason he could never lay her memory entirely to rest was knowing that stone slab at Franklin Cemetery was a formality, an afterthought. It jutted from a grave filled only with roots and dirt and a lie. Hannah's body had never been found. The Lord giveth, and the Lord taketh away. Her voice sounded stronger today, and he almost spoke out loud in reply, almost caught himself chatting like a madman to the blue sky above. No one would blame him, of course, but speaking to your dead wife after ten years was a slippery slope. Once you started, it became ordinary, and he knew men that turned odd from lesser causes. The morning was bright and clear, and Lyle walked the acres of his property, recalling good memories. He smelled vanilla in the air, and it was as if her voice became an aroma, filling his nostrils. Every morning, she had placed a drop of vanilla oil on the sides of her neck, which she breathed in deep whenever he leaned in to kiss her. He passed through rows of apple trees and out the other side, and the green pasture land before him shone with sparkles of light as if the world reflected through an emerald. The land was beautiful, and he thought again of Hannah. The great black hole that lay open in the earth before him was so unexpected he did not immediately register it. Lyle almost walked right in as if that was his plan all along, before yelping and jumping away from the sinking edge. God Almighty, he said, and his face turned pale as ice. He apologized in silence for taking the Lord's name in vain and stared until his mouth nearly fell open as wide as the chasm in the ground. It was a giant sinkhole, a dozen feet across, and appearing as an elevator shaft that dropped so far down that the sun above would never penetrate the darkness of its black depths. Lyle occasionally read in the newspapers 
about sinkholes opening up, some so large a city block could fall into them. Most, though, only dropped ten or twenty feet, as if that part of the Earth's mantle was just the skin of a popped, shallow bubble. He thought he might go mad staring into this hole that somehow he discerned as bottomless. The rim of the sinkhole was smooth, too, like a cartoon hole lacking the rough edges that are expected by the ground's occasional movements. He heard her whisper again, but this time could not be sure if it truly was in his mind or somehow floated up from the descent of the hole. I'm here. Lyle called into Dunbar City Hall and waited on hold nearly twenty minutes before the clerk finally answered. This is Marty Simmons. Sorry for the wait. I was starting to think the city forgot I paid taxes to keep it running. Hey, Lyle, it's been a lunatic morning here. Folks calling in since we opened, until I thought the city woke up with a case of the batshit crazies. Anyway, I can guess what you're calling about. It's some fright when you're strolling along and nearly fall down a pit that decided to open shop on your land. I understand. You're not the only one this happened to. There are others? We've been getting calls from all over the city. A sinkhole open next to Tom Grady's house and another on Liz Townsend's farm. Got reports from Charles Halloway, John Clark, and a handful of others. One sinkhole opened up on Stephen Brown's land that three of his heifers fell into. He can't hear a cry from any of them, they fell so deep. Hell, one hole even opened up right behind Cornerstone Baptist Church. I never heard of the ground turning to Swiss cheese before, Lyle said. Nor I. Now you know why it took so long to get your call. Liz Townsend's in hysterics. She even says she heard a voice from the hole on her farm, like maybe someone tumbled in. Phew, did he have any plans about what'll be done to fix this, or should I just build an outhouse over it? Marty chuckled, then paused. I'll make a report for you. Suppose we can hold a meeting tomorrow for everyone affected. Find out who's got it worse and go from there. The news already reached Pittsburgh, and some reporters are coming in today. And so the vultures found a new scrap to feed on. They love to rub salt in our wounds. Never come around when we're prospering, but if there's an accident, suddenly the news crews appear, calling us superstitious on one hand and cursed on the other. Any thoughts as to what may have caused these holes? Lyle asked. Dunno. Maybe an earthquake? Maybe groundwater eating away at the bedrock beneath us? Remember the sinkhole in Allentown last year? Half the city was evacuated for fear the earth was caving in. That's what's going to happen here. Mark my words. It'll take more than a hole on my property to make me pack it up. <laughs> we'll see. Anyway, pal, I got the next call waiting on hold. Stop by tomorrow and we'll chat. After Lyle hung up, the morning didn't seem as bright and clear as earlier, before he nearly walked into the sinkhole. The sky was still blue, as it so often is in southern Pennsylvania, but he discerned a fine veil seeming to drape over his corner of the land. There were murmurs in his thoughts that didn't resemble his own, and a chill touched his skin. He didn't want to be alone in the house today, amongst the dusty memories and sense of foreboding. As empty as it was, he would pay his respects at Hannah's grave, then fill the day with chores and errands to keep his mind from dwelling on troubles. And that's what he did. The bed seemed larger than ever that night, a great expanse of stuffing and blankets that, instead of providing comfort, only accentuated the emptiness. Lyle lay with his hands crossed behind his head, resting on the same side he'd always lain, him on the right and Hannah on the left. On the far wall, past the void she once filled, a window gaped open, 
and he heard the late-night critters of the land, the crickets and owls and coyotes. He heard, too, a woman's voice, like the drifting shreds of a kite, torn and blowing without direction between the tree branches. No man dieth to himself, she said. He sat up and cocked his head, trying to filter out that voice amongst the other nighttime noises. Hannah's memory had nestled up cozy in the back of his head today, whispering to him louder and louder, and he began to doubt the distinction between what intoned amongst his thoughts and what sounded in reality. A distant dog barked at some unseen foe, and rustling tree limbs pushed against each other. A gust of wind scattered dry leaves against the window, some floating through to land on the floor, like discarded broken relics. Lyle found himself wondering what existed in the night, what rose when men slept and moved amongst the mountain's enigmas. He had lived in Dunbar all his life. The city nestled far into the base of the Allegheny Mountains' green and silver range. There were things in those mountains that the rest of the world never heard about, but Lyle knew since boyhood. There was a man of green light who lived inside Dante's cave, and if you saw him, you went blind. A pair of creatures that were half horse, half bear, lived in the woods on the far end of Hunter's Loop, and if you strayed into their lair under a full moon, you'd never stray back out. Goblins and shades and talking beasts all lived within a day's hike of Dunbar, and Lyle knew all their exploits. Anything could exist in that territory where Indians once fought using dinosaur bones. Of course, some of those things were mired in superstition, while only one or two were hard truth. But figuring where myth ended and fact began was like trying to measure the distance of a fart in a whirlwind. Great are the mysteries of the world, he thought. But know, too, that God has a place for all things, and though we may not understand, it is not for us to question his reasons. He closed his eyes, inducing the ritual of memories that preceded sleep. The woman's voice sounded again, louder this time, more clear. And to earth we shall return. Lyle scrambled to the window and leaned out. Someone out there? The moon cast long shadows, pulling each tree into a stick giant. Things pattered and moved in the night, and he smelled the slightest fragrance of vanilla. Lyle. He got into his trousers and shirt quick as a whistle and dashed outside with his Coleman lantern. This is private property, he called out to the stars. If you need something, you'd best name yourself. I've been waiting. This time, the voice sounded muffled, as if sinking. It drifted from the apple orchards, or perhaps what lay on the other side of the orchards. He swung the lantern across the path of trampled grass that led into the trees. If you're ribbing me, I'll knock you into Tuesday, he shouted. The voice did not reply, and that worried him more than if it continued speaking from the gloom. Was it Hannah's voice in his head, getting louder as if finding a way to break through the aural barrier of his consciousness into the real world? Something moved in the darkness, a leathery whisk of flight and a shaking branch. Lyle crossed between the apple trees, and it flew past with a whoosh. He waved the Coleman and spotted a small bat darting after the glowing tails of fireflies. The scent of vanilla grew stronger. It was a hypnotic fragrance, an alluring tug that suggested he close his eyes and float along the stream of memories. He kept walking, following it past the apple orchards. 
Lyle. He found himself standing again at the lip of the sinkhole. The lantern shone past its smooth edges into a darkness that somehow was twice as black as the midnight sky above. Come to me as we are one. The misery and loneliness of ten years felt as if it sloughed off like caked dirt under a hot shower. He felt lighter, calmer, as if he had a purpose, a destination. I've missed you. The voice was real, was Hannah's, and he wondered at his sanity, if he had, perhaps, even gone crazy long ago, and the sinkhole was really a tunnel dug through his own brain by grief. He stepped nearer to its edge. So close, a tap from behind might propel him forward, and he searched for her face within the ebony nothingness. How long did it take a body to decompose back into the elements it sprang from? How long for a body crushed and buried to dissolve under the moving earth until its bones became soft as soot and guts the fertilizer for plants? What did Pastor Scott say? Earth to earth, ashes to ashes, dust to dust. She was the earth now, and she called to him. He leaned forward. Lyle. The voice seemed to pull him in, but on the brink of surrender, he threw himself backward, landing on his keister in the cold grass. The coalman clattered aside, pointing a beam across the sinkhole. What am I doing? he thought, and scrambled further away. She ain't down there. It's been ten years. He looked up to the crescent moon and sprawl of stars, as if searching for a sign. Lyle retrieved the lantern and rushed back to his house. He thought her voice chased him from behind the apple orchards, like a child's game of tag, but he willed himself to stop listening. Once inside, he locked the doors and closed the windows and opened his Bible for answers, wondering if he fled from the one thing he regularly begged God to return. Late the next morning, Lyle drove around the winding mountain roads and into Dunbar. Parking was crowded in front of City Hall's red brick facade, most of the spaces filled by out-of-town cars, and a couple large news vans decorated with satellite dishes and tall antennas. He parked and got out and walked to the building's glass front doors. Marty Simmons approached from behind, smoking a Marlboro. Don't let those reporters know you got a hole on your land, he said. They making a big deal of it? Lyle asked. Bigger than you know. He took a drag and exhaled in a blue-gray cloud. Walk with me. They turned away from City Hall and strode down the sidewalk toward the gazebo next to Dunbar's library. Where's everyone else? Lyle asked. Thought we were going to have a meeting. Most folks are staying away while the media's sitting here. I sure know how to turn bad into worse. Marty nodded, and a sprinkle of cigarette ash fell onto his collared shirt. Remember I told you a sinkhole opened up right behind the church? I do. It was a big hole, Lyle, big enough to drive a full-size truck into, and I don't know how deep it went. I was out there yesterday morning after I talked with you. I tossed a rock down and never heard it hit bottom. It sounds like what I've got. The hole is gone. Gone? Like filled in? Filled in, closed up, whatever you want to call it. It's gone, and there ain't even a hint there ever was a hole. No depression in the land, no cracks in the earth. The grass is growing green and cut short like a lawnmower just went over it last week. Uh, that don't make sense. Exactly. 
I went back out there this morning with the sheriff and the news crews. They wanted to film one of our sinkholes, and what better for sensationalism than showing Cornerstone Baptist Church as the backdrop? Of course, so they can remind us of ten years ago. Pastor Scott was going to meet us by the hole, too, but never showed. I asked around, and nobody's caught a trace of him since yesterday. He was supposed to have dinner last night with the mayor, but never arrived. It's like he vanished. You think something happened to him? I don't know, but the sheriff sent a couple men to look around. The reporter started questioning the sinkholes as a hoax, but I'm taking them out to investigate Liz Townsend's farm next. They're talking with some council members right now. Anyway, I'd suggest steering clear of the pack. The media's like a sick dog, and you never know who they're going to crap on. Thanks for the advice. Marty stubbed out the Marlboro on the banister rail of the gazebo. He looked around to make sure no one was watching, then flicked the butt into the street. Sweeper's coming by tomorrow, he said. Lyle shrugged. Another thing, Marty said. And you might think my screw's turning loose, but it hasn't gotten past me. That mudslide disaster was ten years ago to the day. Nature's got cruel timing. I don't think it's a coincidence. The sinkholes? Lyle, it ain't just the hole on your land. It's all the sinkholes. Remember, I'm the one logging the reports. I told you some of who were affected. It's the families of those who were carried away. Uh, go on. Marty lifted a hand and began ticking away fingers. Tom Grady's got a hole alongside his house. Like you, he lost his wife at that picnic. I catch him crying sometimes when he's sitting alone at the diner. Then there's Liz Townsend, whose husband Eddie was taken. She holds onto the past like a girl clutches her toy doll. They're inseparable. Remember that no trace of Stephen and Ruth Brown's two sons was ever found, except a penny loafer caught on a tree limb. Charles Halloway lost his sister, and John Clark lost his parents. Ain't a one of them ever fully recovered. And a dozen others from that day, they've all got sinkholes on their land. Oh, that's a heavy load. But what does it mean? I don't know. Think about Pastor Scott, who put the picnic together. If the Lord was assessing faith that day, Scott was tested the greatest. He lost his wife and all three daughters to that mudslide. A sinkhole appeared alongside his church. And now it's gone. And so is he, Marty said. All these years he preached to us, saying those killed were in a better place. But I know it was eating him up inside. It's a catch-22. He couldn't curse the Lord or question his almighty will for their deaths. Otherwise, he won't end up in the heaven he believes his family's waiting at. Lyle shook his head. Marty continued. So Pastor Scott kept preaching at the pulpit, smiling and saying it's all part of a grand plan, everything happens for a reason, and it's not our place to question why. If Scott believed that, perhaps he saw the sinkholes as a message, another test of his faith. That's a big leap you're suggesting. And maybe it brought him back to his family in some way. Or maybe I'm just making too much of this, framing crazy assumptions like the reporters. Well, nothing sounds too crazy to me, Lyle said. That pit on my land isn't natural. Up the street, people began to exit City Hall, milling around cars and talking on cell phones. Looks like it's time to get back, Marty said. I'll see what happens at Liz Townsend's farm. Let me know. In the meantime, I think I'll check on the Browns myself. Ten years ago, he heard her after the mudslide hit, after the crashing thunder of earth silenced and shock passed like a crack of lightning. In that spare second, before the others started screaming, he heard her voice from the mud and debris. 
Lyle? Then the shriek sounded, and the pleas, and people scrambling to unbury themselves or their loved ones. It was a dervish of neighbors and fellow parishioners, digging through the sludge, shouting for help, ordering commands, moaning, crying. And he tried to tell everyone to shut up. He nearly wished the panicked and wounded were all dead, so in their silence he could hear Hannah follow her voice to where the avalanche took her. But the wailing around him increased, and the others thought they heard their own parents and spouses and children crying from under the mud, and everyone then shouted louder, trying to bellow over the others, so that Lyle never heard her voice again. The morning before the disaster was good, such as days can be when begun with turquoise skies and the whistle of wrens and a plate of pancakes steaming in the cold spring dawn. Her smell of vanilla oil broke through the warm maple syrup, and they ate together, commenting on what they did yesterday and what they would do today. That afternoon was Cornerstone Baptist Church's annual picnic, set on the shore of McGowan's Lake under the shade of the Allegheny Mountains. Lyle and Hannah almost didn't go, as it was a Saturday afternoon and Lyle wanted to plant, and Hannah needed to pick up some camera equipment from Pittsburgh. But the absence from church events is conspicuous in small towns, and they knew what sort of comments might be made from behind-the-hand mutters. So they arrived at the picnic early, in order to stake a location overlooking the cold lake's cyan face. There may have been a hundred people in attendance that bright afternoon. Kites came out, and children ran amongst trees. Tables were set, with red and white gingham, and platters shared of fried chicken, coleslaw, baked beans, and cobbler. Lyle and Hannah sat with Stephen and Ruth Brown and laughed at long-running jokes. Pastor Scott spoke to each in attendance, commenting on the chicken's flavor or a mother's pretty dress. Scott's wife picked flowers with a group of children. Then a rumble sounded, and the earth shook, and the world seemed to crack in half. It was early spring, and the snow runoff had loosened the slope of Hardy Hill. With a shattering detonation, the slope slid down in a great wave of mud and rock and swept away the picnickers. In that spare second, after the earth settled and before the survivors started screaming, he heard her voice from the sludge and debris. Lyle! Lyle stood with Stephen and Ruth Brown and looked deep into the sinkhole on their pasture land. The hole was identical to his own, as if the chasms were born as twins, each about twelve feet across and cut perfectly into the earth, like someone drilled cylinders straight into the ground. Can you hear them? Stephen Brown asked, in a voice so tiny mice could have roared louder. Lyle shook his head. The hole could have led to another universe for the depth that appeared to fall. There are sons, Ruth said. They're calling to us from down there. He looked at each of the Browns, then back into the hole. Lyle didn't know if coming here was a mistake or a vindication of his sanity. At least he knew he wasn't the only one listening to voices that weren't there. He shook his head again. I don't hear anything. Ruth sobbed, and Stephen almost did too. We've still got his shoe. Jeremy's little shoe. He's down there with a bare foot. They're looking for us. They miss us. They say, where are you, Mommy and Daddy? Stephen reached around his wife's shoulders, and she turned her head against his chest and held him tight. <sighs> I can't say whether you're imagining it or not, Lyle said. I hear Hannah on my own land. Ruth spoke into her husband's chest. 
Pastor Scott said the same about his own family. Stephen nodded. I was at the church yesterday afternoon. I saw the sinkhole, and Pastor Scott stood so close on its edge, his toes hung over. He told me they were down there, all of them, his wife and three daughters. He said, the Lord was giving them back. The earth would make them a family again. Pastor Scott's disappeared, Lyle said. I know. A deputy came by a bit ago, asking when I saw him last. He tried to tell me there wasn't any hole on the church grounds at all, but it was there. I saw it. I believe you. Marty Simmons saw it too. Maybe they weren't supposed to have been taken from us that day. Or maybe we were supposed to have joined them. Maybe whoever plans these things made a mistake. But that hole is speaking to us. It's telling us our boys are down there, Lyle said. I'm going in. I'm going to find our sons, no matter how far down they've fallen. Lyle thought obligation should compel him to convince Stephen otherwise. Tell him it was madness to climb into that pit, looking for people who were missing, surely dead, for ten years. It was duty to talk a friend out of doing something that would likely lead to injury or worse. But at the same time, he believed them to be right. And what he wanted most that moment was to return home, because he now believed Hannah really was there, calling for him from the darkness of his sinkhole. He decided such because she didn't call for him on the Browns' land. Here, her voice was silent. Here, it was the sinkhole only for the Browns' sons. This was no trick of his brain, no phenomena of his surroundings. She called for him from one place only, that place she was taken, as she had called for him the day of the picnic. Night fell, and Lyle sat on his porch listening. She was out there, whispering to him. Come to me, Lyle. He had a decision to make, but he let it stretch out before him, allowing the moment to simmer, listening to Hannah's words as if she sat on the porch alongside him. I've been waiting such a long time. If he decided her return was a transgression against natural order, he could simply leave and didn't think she would follow. Lyle considered that whatever caused the earth to open up its secrets for him was a one-time offer. Whether it was the Lord's choice or a trick, she was here and here only. If he left, he would never hear her voice again. Or he could find her. She was down there, like all the other people killed that afternoon by McGowan's Lake, returned to collect their loved ones. Without Hannah, there wasn't much in the world that kept him going. No other family or opportunities. Just gray age and loneliness. Was it different for any of the others from that church picnic? Had they ever stopped grieving, or did it matter? Maybe it wasn't just the survivors who grieved all these years. Maybe it was the dead, too, stolen from the sunshine and arms of their loved ones, buried under the mud and never found. Until now. Lyle. The Lord giveth and the Lord taketh away, he thought. He thought also of the message saved on his phone. Lyle had arrived home from the Browns' farm and saw the blinking green light on his answering machine. It was Marty Simmons. Stay away from the sinkhole, Lyle. Whatever it is you think you hear, stay away. Liz Townsend is missing. The hole behind her farm is gone. I saw her earlier today with the reporters and she swore her dead husband was calling. Now John Clark is missing, and Charles Halloway. The holes on their grounds are closed up too, like they never existed. Something took them away. It ain't natural, Lyle, not to hear someone who's been buried ten years. 
Listen to me. Call me. Come back to town. Just stay away from that hole. But Marty was only another voice now, like Hannah, a murmur without physical form, a ventriloquism speaking from the chasm of his mind. We're all just Earth, after all. He found it took less time than ever to make his way across the yard, through the apple trees, and out the other side, into the pasture. He brought the Coleman to light his way, though he didn't need it. He could close his eyes, and she would lead him to the brink of reunion. Vanilla curled around his limbs, and the moon split in two. When Lyle looked again upon the black sinkhole, he realized it wasn't a sinkhole at all, and he wondered how he ever thought different. It was a mouth, and her lips began to rise from the edges of its opening, parting slightly to show the curve of a coral pink tongue. The contours of the ground flexed and eddied as if made of soft mud, and Hannah's mouth moved, opening wider. Her lips pursed, bulging from the land in prodigious mass, and she spoke. Come to me. The night critters were silent. He no longer heard their chirps or howls or croaks. Earth to earth, ashes to ashes, dust to dust. He saw a vision of himself sitting on the porch, contemplating the years since Hannah's death, when a crash sounded and a mudslide roared from the night stars to carry him away. He was wrong to think he would be allowed to leave. He could never escape the earth. So he leaned in to kiss her lips the way he did every morning after she placed a drop of vanilla oil on the sides of her neck. I've missed you. Lyle knelt, and vanilla-scented mud gathered at his feet. He was sucked into the hole before he could say goodbye. He fell through memories and dreams, and thought he heard Stephen Brown calling for his sons. Whether he was dead or insane, touched by God, or called by Hannah, he couldn't say. He wondered why the voice in his head turned silent. The faraway sky vanished, and the sinkhole closed its lips, and Lyle was swallowed into the earth.